just scrolling through some social media feeds this week, I came across a really interesting post from a church I follow in my old neck of the woods in San Jose, and it was a sermon summary from their last Sunday's message, and I found it interesting because they were also in the story of Joseph. And summing up the the sermon, this is what the post said, what elevated Joseph from slave to the most powerful man in the kingdom was his ability to continue to do good even when everything looked like it was against him. It was that goodness that elevated him everywhere he went, so keep doing good. What elevated Joseph was his ability to do good, so keep doing good. But is that what we've been reading in the book of Genesis? You're sensible people. You read your Bibles. Is it Joseph's goodness that's elevated him? Or is it God's unmerited grace? If anything, Joseph's goodness, whatever that is, it's kind of landed him in a heap of trouble, hasn't it? I mean, so keep doing good and you too can get sold by your brothers and accused by your boss's wife. Wait, that doesn't sound good. So I actually think that this story of Joseph is teaching us something very important, but in all the way the other direction, I think the story of Joseph and the story of Genesis is showing us that in ourselves, none of us have any ability to do good. These are not good people. These are sinners. And in myself, I, I can't save myself and I can't elevate myself. Not by my morals, not by my pedigree, not by my education, not by my effort. Think about the story we're looking at here in Joseph. On one level, you have this massive famine that's infecting everything. And the mighty King Pharaoh and the patriarch of Israel himself, they can't do anything to stop it, can they? Whatever goodness they can muster up, they're coming to admit it's out of our control. Then in the middle, you have these ten brothers, and they're guilty, and they can't do anything to cover up or make up for their sin. They can't pay it back. They can't hide it anymore. They profess their goodness, but they know they're guilty before God. And on top of that, we have this guy, Joseph. He's elevated not by his goodness, but by God's goodness. And God has elevated him, not because Joseph has any innate goodness in himself, but God has actually elevated Joseph so that the Lord God can show his goodness to very undeserving people. Today in our text, there are three important Christian words that are going to come to us. One is in verse 13 of chapter 43. It's God's mercy. The next one comes in verse 23. It's God's peace. And then in verse 29, God's grace. And they all point us to how good the Lord God is to us. Brothers and sisters, this is a very terrible burden to carry around to think that it's your goodness that brings God's favor and blessing on your life. It's attractive on the surface, it's appealing, but in the end, it just sinks you in waves of arrogance and depression, doesn't it? In today's reading, I believe we see the exact opposite of that, and we see what our God truly wants. He wants our surrender, our surrender to the fact that we are not good, our surrender to the fact that we are not in control. I think what we see here is the Father Israel and all these brothers and Joseph himself, they all surrender to the reality that they are not in control and that God mercifully gives us what we don't deserve and what we could not earn by His grace. And it's His grace that brings us peace with Him today's passage, we're also going to see the beginning of the awesome transformation of this brother Judah, 
who becomes a savior figure for his entire family, and he becomes a substitute for Benjamin, offering to forever bear the blame of guilt. My great hope is not in my goodness. My great hope is the perfection of my Savior, who is my great substitute, who substituted his life for my life. So if you, if you want to take a note, this is my summary of what we'll hear today, and you can check it with the Bible and see if it adds up. If you grab onto anything today, maybe it will be this. I wrote down in this word, surrender. We surrender every, every part of our lives to Jesus, our perfect substitute, who lived the perfect life and died the perfect death in our place. By grace alone, Jesus gives us mercy we did not deserve and peace we did not earn. I surrender to this substitute, Jesus Christ. I think that's what God is after, that we continually as his people surrender any hope in our own goodness, any hope in saving ourselves, and we turn to the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. We surrender all that we have to him. Well, if you open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 23, that's where we'll be today in the whole chapter. And um, I'm, I'm going to, since this is as a narrative, I'm going to preach just through the reading of this scripture. So keep your Bibles open as we go through. If you haven't been with us, this is where we are in Genesis 43. There is a massive famine that God has sent and it has brought Israel's family to Egypt. It has brought Joseph's brothers to Egypt to buy grain. Joseph knows who they are, but they don't have a clue about who he is. And God here on this chapter and on into the next, God is using Joseph to wisely and powerfully test his brothers, to expose their hearts and their guilt, and then in this testing to transform them Joseph has captured, if you remember, the second old brother, Simeon. He's kept him there, and he sent the other nine home with bags full of grain and grain bags full of money, their money. And Joseph told them, don't return unless you bring your youngest brother, Benjamin, with you. But there's a problem. Their father won't let them take Benjamin out of Canaan. So now the brothers have this massive problem on their hands. They can't take Benjamin, they can't get more food, and they're all going to die. And even if they can take Benjamin, how in the world are they going to explain how all that money is still in their sacks and they didn't pay for anything? Now they're going to be spies and thieves. And on top of all of this, they have this black cloud of guilt over their heads. They know as they've come to face facts that they are sinners and they have sinned against their brother. And they know that somehow, in some way, the Lord God knows this. And there will be a reckoning. It all looks hopeless. What we're going to see, though, is through this one man, Joseph, this servant of God, the merciful, providing, gracious God, is going to begin to bring peace to this shattered family. And all of this is just one piece in the Lord God's awesome plans to bring salvation to the world. That's what this story is about. Let's pray as we open our Bibles. Lord, we come to hear you talk to us. Would you reveal yourself? And in revealing, Lord, would you shock and test and open up our hearts? We want to not just understand these words on the page, Lord, but we want to understand you. We want to in a way, see through these like a window to see into you and your kingdom and see how worthy and amazing you are and to know what it means to be your people, surrendered to you. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. So we start in verse 1. Now the famine was severe in the land. Again, nobody knew how long this Famine was going to last, except God and Joseph and the people Joseph told. It's going to last seven years. Maybe in Israel they thought they would just get by. Verse 2, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, go again, buy us a little food. 
Now, Israel must know this, and his brothers know it. I mean, they're waiting for the food to run out, but is anyone concerned about Simeon? Remember, he's still bound, and he's still stuck back there. Maybe they've had this conversation a million times, like, Dad, we got to go back for Simeon, and it's taken this last straw of running out of grain for this to happen. But do they love their brothers? Part of the test. Verse 3, But Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Then what we see in chapter 43 and into 44 and 45 is in this kind of peak of this epic Joseph story, we also see Judah rising up. Judah here becomes the spokesperson for his family. He stands up, he says, and he becomes the leader. If you remember, Jacob, Israel, the father, has shut down the oldest brother Reuben's offer in chapter 42. He offered, hey, I'll give you my sons. Let me take Benjamin. And Israel said, no way. And now Judah, who's the fourth brother, he's the fourth son, the fourth son of Leah, the one that Leah exclaimed, now I will worship the Lord when he was born. That fourth son, Judah now, comes up to be superior in this family. This whole story, which centers on Joseph, also really figures about Judah at the center, that Judah is preserved, and it's from Judah that later on, The line of kings will come, David and Solomon, and eventually the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. What we see is that Joseph and Judah, they're going to eclipse all their older brothers in land, in authority, in significance. Joseph is going to assume the firstborn's privileges. All the other brothers, they bow down to him in this chapter, all 11 of them. But Judah takes over the firstborn's place of responsibility for the 11 brothers. He acts as the eldest brother, and he steps up to secure life for this family. Verse 6, Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, bring your brother down? You hear in Israel or Jacob, the father, Israel, his covenant name, you hear and hear an air of desperation. They must have discussed this a million times around the dinner table. But Israel, it seems, keeps bringing it up after all this time of going through this grain. Why? Why did you have to tell them about Benjamin? Why did you have to open your big mouth? Why did you have to make this problem? Why did you have to give it away that there was another brother? And what we see is Israel is still fighting to hold on to Benjamin, his beloved and his favored son. Israel was still showing his favoritism. And in a way... I believe Israel was still showing one of his idols here. Israel had such a tremendous fear of letting his son go, of his son dying. Benjamin, he believes, is the last child he has from his beloved wife, Rachel. Joseph's gone. This is the last child, and it seems that he counts Benjamin as really his only child. He doesn't even care about the other ten in the same way. He seems to say, if if I lose this one, then I am all alone. I'm lost. Of course, it's, it's very good and natural for parents to not want to lose their children. It's in a, in a healthy way. In healthy times, we are jealous and zealous for our children, aren't we? For their safety, for their well-being. But there's a test, I think, in all of us here in what Israel is is going on in his heart. There's a test for all of us, whether you're a parent or a grandparent or not any of those. And the test is really about idolatry. 
I've said it before, and I think we, we need to hear it again and again. One of the great tests for knowing if there's an idol in your heart, for discovering idols in your life, is to ask yourself prayerfully this question, what if I lost it would make life seem unbearable? Absolutely not worth living. What if I couldn't have it anymore would make me not want to go on? What if I lost it in this life? It wouldn't just hurt me, but it would crush me where I thought I could never get back up again. The answer to that is likely an idol in your life or the potential for one. If you look back at Israel's words in chapter 42, verse 38, he said this, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he's the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. You compare that with how he mourned uncontrollably at the loss of Joseph when he believed. And I think you see in Israel's heart, not just a favorite child, but the inkling of an idol that he has. How about you and how about me? What is it for us that maybe God is telling us we need to surrender to him? What in your life, if you lost it, would make life not worth living anymore? Your wealth, your career, your beauty, your spouse, the way people esteem you, your freedom, your nightly 8 p.m. ritual, your health, your retirement plan, your skills, your hobbies, your children. We can't answer for Israel, but each idol has a promise. That's why they're an idol. They promise us something. In the negative, it promises, if you lose me, life is not going to be good anymore. If you can't get me, life is not worth living. You'll never be content. You'll never be accepted. You'll never be happy if you don't have me. In our lives in Christ, dear ones, Jesus calls us to surrender all to him, including all the idols of our hearts. It's Jesus Christ is the only one who can make us feel truly content, can't he? The only one who can give us real acceptance, real freedom, real identity, real hope. He's the only one who can give us real joy and rescue us. And unlike any idol, we never have to fear about losing Jesus, do we? He is ours and we are his. Well, that's what Judah, I think, is stepping up to say. He says, Dad, you got to let this one go. Verse 8, Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die. There's those words again. Both we and you and also our little ones. Verse 9, I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would now have returned twice. Those words are very important words here. Let us go so that we may live and not die. Those are words that Israel said himself in the last chapter. And what Judah is talking about that Israel can't even know is Judah is talking about the threat of the famine, of course, and the threat of Joseph, this leader of Egypt. And when we hear those words, let us live and not die, when we zoom out, on the whole story of this covenant family, the family of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and of these 12 brothers, we see that this is one more time in this family of urgency and desperation because this family has been in a life and death situation again and again and again, haven't they? Not even knowing if they're going to have children that are going to come into this world. They've gone through war and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. They've gone through famine before. They've gone through the infighting of families and of slaves. They've gone through brothers about to wipe each other out. But each of those times, this family, these patriarchs and these matriarchs and their children, 
They haven't been saved by their wits. They haven't escaped doom by their planning or by their goodness, have they? But at each moment when it was life and death and it looked hopeless, the Lord God mercifully has come down and intervened, hasn't he? He's always been in control and in his perfect timing and in his unstoppable ways, he keeps saving them. He keeps making this family go on. And here, that comes through Judah. Judah steps up with an appeal to his father of simple logic. He says, you know, Dad, you can try to hold on to your son, but if you don't let him go, you die, and we die, and all your grandchildren die, and there's nobody left. And then Judah backs up the logic with a promise. And what a moment this is. He says, I will be a pledge of his safety From my hand you shall require him. What is Judah saying? He's saying, you hold me personally responsible. This is the first good thing that we see of Judah in the book of Genesis. And I believe God is showing over this chapter and next the transformation of this man. A transformation that first started probably back in Genesis 38, that really dark chapter with his daughter-in-law Tamar. Do you remember that? And at the end, he confessed, she is more righteous than I am. And he faced his sin as his brothers faced last chapter. Previously, Judah was the one who proposed the sale of Joseph. And now he's proposing the safety of Benjamin to rescue the family. What a change God has done in this man. Judah was the one who so wrongfully treated his daughter-in-law Tamar. He slept with her thinking she was a harlot, and he withheld from her the pledge of his son. And do you remember when he went to his daughter-in-law as a prostitute, he also had a pledge. Do you remember what he pledged? He pledged his staff, and he pledged a lamb, and he pledged it to get pleasure. Well, what a transformation. Here he is now. He's pledging his life not his staff, and not for pleasure. He's pledging his life for the safety of his whole family. He's making it possible by his oath, by his pledge. He's saying, Dad, you can hold me eternally responsible for this. It seems in the ancient world they believed not only that they would go on living through their children, but to some degree they would be gathered to their fathers. They would go on living in eternity with their family. And it's almost as if Joseph is saying, God, uh, dad, I mean, Judah saying to his dad, dad, even in the afterlife, you can keep bringing this up. You can hold me responsible. I will be eternally responsible for this. I'll bear this weight forever. And instead of offering the death of his children like Reuben, Judah steps up as a substitute himself and says, it's me. I'll do this. And he's offering his life and his reputation, and his name. And he's doing it for his brother Benjamin and his brother Simeon, and he's doing it for Israel. He's doing it for the whole family. He's doing this for the well-being of the entire Israelite family. He says, I will make this possible that we can go and that we can live. Well, let's look at that what happens? This, this is the, what the, the family needs. They need an older brother like this. And then look at verses 11 through 14. We see Israel, Israel's own surrender. In verse 11, it seems that Judah's words are working by God's grace. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man. A little balm and a little honey, gum, myrrh, pistachio nuts, and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise. Go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man, and may he send back to your other brother and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Israel relents, right? And he sends his brothers back, his sons back to Egypt. 
And he sends them with three important pieces of cargo, right? He sends them with the most important piece, his son Benjamin. He relents. He surrendered. Then he sends them with double the money. I'm not one much for numbers in the Bible so much, but they sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver, and now if 10 brothers double what they had before, they're bringing back 20 bags of silver to Joseph. I think there's something there. And they're taking a gift, right? They're taking produce from the promised land. This is also very interesting because It's a gift that Israel couldn't possibly understand. He suggests they take this produce, things that the Egyptians would like, things that came from Canaan. But if you look back in Genesis 37, this is what it says about the people who bought Joseph and took him to slavery in Egypt. A caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels. What were they bringing? Gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Very similar cargo. Can you imagine then when Joseph opens this gift and he smells that stuff at once? He smells his homeland and breaks into tears. That's what his house smells like. That's the stuff of the promised land, but also weeps and heartbroken that the last time he smelled this stuff was on a long trip into slavery into Egypt on a long caravan. I think God's at work here again. But what's really important here are Israel's words, his, his prayer in verse 14. He says, may God Almighty, that's El Shaddai, may God Almighty grant you mercy before the man and send back your other brother and Benjamin. Israel here, he finally relents. I, I think he surrenders. At the end of his rope, he realizes that he's not in control. He realizes that just like with the weather, and just like with the confrontation with his brother Esau, this is out of his power. And he turns to God and does an intercessory prayer. He asks God for intercession. God, help my children. And what what does he pray? Who does he turn to exactly? He says, may El Shaddai, God Almighty, grant you mercy and compassion before the man Israel uses perhaps maybe the most common name of God for the patriarchs, this name El Shaddai. It calls out God's omnipotence, His unlimited, unmatched power, His unstoppable power, that He can do anything He wants, power. But it's not just a power of thunderous might that He can crush His enemies. This name El Shaddai is also the power that God is powerful to care for His people. He's powerful to save his people. Nothing will be able to stop this kind of God from delivering and rescuing his people. He's powerful enough to always supply exactly what his children need. The name El Shaddai in the book of Genesis, it, it's most often associated with God's covenant and his covenant promises. When you hear that name El Shaddai, it means the Lord is powerful enough to come through on his promises. Once again, he's not just kind to make a promise. He's not nice to just want to fulfill his promises. He is El Shaddai who is powerful to make a promise and fulfill the promise exactly as he said he would. When you hear that name, he's unstoppably capable of always coming through to accomplish his will. He cannot be stopped by weather or by kings or by the evil one or by evil children like us. He's El Shaddai. Well, at the end of the rope, the father ends up where he should have begun, turning to El Shaddai, crying out for mercy, appealing to his great compassion and mercy to deliver his people. You think about this in this father Israel, maybe he had been coming to the Lord God praying, God, could you end this famine? Could you send rain on this land? Dear God, could you release my son? Dear God, could you put an end to this? But God had a plan that was much bigger 
than Jacob ever imagined. And perhaps even a small part of God's great plan was God was doing a lot of this to move Israel's heart again, to surrender Benjamin, to put all of his hope in El Shaddai, the Lord. Because God had covenant plans going on here. He had big plans of deliverance, plans that are bigger than Israel the man, plans that are bigger than Israel the nation, plans to bring salvation to all of the nations is what God was up to. And God was going to come through with his promises. You know, dear ones, there'd be nothing wrong for Israel to pray, dear God, end this famine. Dear God, send us relief. Make crops grow. Especially if Israel didn't know what God was up to. Maybe he'd even forgotten or he'd never heard from his grandfather Abraham what God had said. My people are going to be down in Egypt and be slaves for many years. But regardless, we know, don't we? We know that God's in absolute control. So that should change how we come to El Shaddai and pray. God, end this famine. God, end this injustice. God, take away the intolerance and evil from our country. End this racism. End this poverty in my house and in my community. Take away this virus. End idolatry. End joblessness. Dear God, take away this sickness and this pain from my life. God, take away this heartache. Dear Father in heaven, send us relief. But at the same time we pray things like that, if we're praying to the same God, El Shaddai, we should pray, I believe, wondering and trusting. God who is all-powerful, you can take these things away, but what I want is your will to be done and not mine. If you're using this situation for some other great good, it might be something big and beautiful that I don't even understand. I might not see it in my lifetime. But God, you are merciful. I trust you. You are powerful. I trust you. You haven't failed because you can't fail because you're El Shaddai. And I think we can pray, even in the middle of tragedy, God, Take this away, but also El Shaddai, grant us mercy and compassion in this tragedy, in this situation. That's what Jacob's praying. He's praying that El Shaddai will mightily show mercy to these sons of his in this impossible situation, in this tragedy. What does that mean exactly? I believe that this is actually the first use of mercy in the Bible. In the book of Genesis and in the Bible, this is the first time we get the Hebrew word for mercy. Well, what is it that Israel's praying for? Mercy is when someone, biblically speaking, in power withholds punishment that is deserved. They don't do what they should do to someone who should get it. Someone who can't stop them, someone that they are powerless against. Mercy is when someone powerful withholds punishment that is deserved. Mercy and grace are not the same things, but they work together. Mercy is undeserved leniency. Undeserved leniency, a pardon. Grace is undeserved favor, undeserved blessing. So what's Jacob praying exactly? He's asking the Almighty, show these undeserving boys mercy. They don't have a card to play here, God. They are in the Pharaoh's hands. But that Pharaoh, he's in your hands, God. Would you show these boys mercy? I can't appeal to you by their character or their morals because, God, you know most of all these boys are rank sinners, just like me, just like the rest of us. We don't deserve your mercy or your compassion, but you are a powerful God. Would you show mercy in this tragedy? Instead of your wrath, El Shaddai, would you please give us your mercy? Instead of what they deserve, would you please be kind to my boys? 
And that's our hope, brothers and sisters. There's a great hope in our life is that the merciful God, El Shaddai, is also a kind, loving God. The God of all power is powerfully merciful too. God's kindness to us, His goodness to us, is not because He's weak. It's not because He's scared of confrontation. It's not because He doesn't care about our sin. It's not because He's powerless to punish us, but He wants to. God is merciful to us out of His unstoppable power. We appeal to Him because He is so perfectly powerful. He's not ruled by His emotions. He's not overcome just in anger, but in His power He can be merciful and righteous and act towards us with mercy. So Israel says, if I'm bereaved of my children, then I'm bereaved. When we come to El Shaddai and we pray and we know things are in his control, there's a very great difference for the Christian between trusting in God and just giving up. I don't know what Israel's doing here. I want to believe he's surrendering. There's a real great difference, though, than just say, whatever, God, to God, whatever you want. It's different than just being tired or exhausted and saying, if, my, if I lose my children, I lose my children. Then to come to El Shaddai and say, God, you gave me these children. They are yours. I don't understand it, but if you take their life, you take their life. And your will be done. As Christians, we're not just fatalist or determinist. And we're not just giving up. We trust in the Lord God. He is powerful to save. And that's what Israel does. He puts these children in God's hands, I believe. Let's go on and see the surrender that happens at the house. Verses 15 through 36 here. Verse 15, So the men took this present, and they took double the money with them and Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. Verse 18, and the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house. And they said, it is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may assault us and fall upon us to make us servants and seize our donkeys. The drama is is so thick here. They come with presents, they come back, and they can't even believe it. They're going to be invited into the ruler's house. And there's a time, noon. Can you imagine their hearts just counting down those minutes? That's our execution time. And they're overcome. They know they're they're dead. They have this coming to them. And look at the fear. What are they afraid of? It's, It's beyond ironic. They are afraid that this man, who they don't know is Joseph, will treat them the way they treated Joseph. Maybe he's going to enslave us. Maybe he's going to abuse us. That's what you did to your brother. And and look at the irrationality that happens to all of us in fear, doesn't it? We have some legitimate fears, and then our mind just starts going crazy. And he's going to take our donkeys. The one ruling Egypt with a gold necklace and fine clothes and riding in chariots, he he really wants to waylay you and get your donkeys. But, But that's how fear works, right? I think they're afraid of God's justice, they know. They're going to get treated the way they treated Joseph. Verse 19, So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house, and they spoke with him at the door of the house and said, O my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food, and when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us, And we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He replied, peace to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. And when the man had been brought into the men who went into Joseph's house and given them water, And they had washed their feet, and when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that they should eat bread there. 
You know what wonderful words these brothers hear. They're, you know, they're shaking in fear. They know the hatchet is coming down on them. But they hear, shalom to you. Peace to you. Peace from your God, Elohim, the God of your family, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That God, that God brings you peace. What words do you hear out of some Egyptian steward's mouth telling them this? They're clueless about what's going on. They admit it. We don't even know how the money got in there. They make this last-ditch effort to save their neck, say, we're innocent, we're innocent, we're good. And the man stops them and says, enough, enough, peace, peace. We know what's going on. We, we have the money. It's all been accounted for. Peace to you. Dear ones, that's what, that's what this life is all about, getting peace from God. That's the very good news of this life. Peace to you. We who are sinners before a righteous God, hear those words, peace to you. You no longer have guilt before God. The steward is telling him, it's all right. Don't be afraid. It's covered. We have the money. Someone else has paid. You remember that, that guilt that we talked about in Genesis 42? We said that every human being is trying to do something with the guilt that they know they have before God. Drink it away, party it away, hide it away, pay it off in some way. But we said there's no peace in any of that. There's no shalom. Because you never know if you paid it all off. And you never know when judgment day is going to come, was it enough? Have I done enough? Have I paid enough? And you're like a hamster on a wheel, spinning and spinning and spinning, but you don't go anywhere. There's no peace in that. That's the opposite of shalom. You keep wondering, have I paid enough? Am I out of hell? Am I at least out of purgatory? How are the judgment scales in heaven favoring me or not? How's my goodness going? There's no peace in that. How much more do I owe? There's absolutely no more peace in that. How do you have lasting peace? Someone pays off your debt. Someone covers your sin. What does it mean when the steward says, we have your silver, we received your silver? It means someone paid for all that grain, boys. Who paid? Nothing in life is free. Who paid? Joseph paid. Joseph paid. He covered it for them. When you are forgiven your guilt before God, when your shame and sin is covered, someone pays. Do you know who pays? Our great older brother, Jesus Christ, he pays. He pays it all by taking our sin and our guilt and our shame onto himself. We are brought peace by him suffering in paying for our guilt and our sin. We are forgiven by his life and his resurrection paying for our death in sin. He lived the perfect life that we could not live. He died the perfect death that we could not. He lived the life in our place as our substitute. He died as our substitute. And our first sin is forgiven because He has covered it all. It's all been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. The only one who can remove the penalty for our sin, he paid. And the Father can say, it's accounted for. Your account is clear because my son has paid it all. That's what peace means. Biblical peace, real peace, enduring peace, lasting peace is, I have no more unanswered sin before God. I have no unaccounted for debt. I have no uncovered shame, but Jesus has covered it all, paid it all, taken it all. He's accounted for it all. There's nothing missing. I don't need to look over my shoulder wondering, when is the hammer going to fall on my life? I don't need to look over the other shoulder and wonder, have I done enough? Because Jesus has done it all, hasn't he? He's paid it. It's been received. When he rose from the grave, what that meant is the father said, account paid, I received that. I received that. It's a verification that Jesus is God and it's verification that he paid enough. And that's why he rose. 
I don't want to walk through this life wondering, did I do enough? Have I paid enough? Am I going to get abused? Am I going to get enslaved at the end of this life? Are they going to take my donkeys? I'm going to turn to Jesus. That's the peace in this world comes when God makes peace with me. That is enduring shalom. That is everlasting shalom. That's real shalom, holistic shalom. God makes peace with us. Those brothers didn't get what they deserved, did they? Jacob's prayer was answered, wasn't it? El Shaddai was powerful to show mercy to people who did not deserve it. They thought they were coming in there to get abused and enslaved. Instead, they got their feet washed and their donkeys fed and their stomachs filled with the abundance. And where did it come from? It came from Joseph's table, directly from the ruler. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house, verse 26, to him the present that they had with them and bowed down to him unto the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. And he said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out. And controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. They served him by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. We'll come back to that in the next couple of weeks. Verse 33, they set before him the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. Somehow Joseph arranged them exactly in the order they should be. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were very merry, even intoxicated. They were so merry with him. Again, brothers and sisters, as we think about this with the gospel, those are very important words for every Christian's vocabulary that we came across today. God's mercy, which is undeserved, his leniency. God's peace, which comes to us when he shows us mercy through God the Son, Jesus Christ, taking our sin and covering it and God's peace and grace that we have through that. God, all-powerful El Shaddai, is powerful to give us peace with him instead of his wrath, all by his grace and not by what we deserve, not by what we earn. The very good news is that you and I deserve abuse and enslavement, but instead we get to eat at the king's table with him. Me and you deserve to be kicked to the curb or maybe stay slaves to sin forever, but he sets us free in giving us peace, taking away our guilt and our shame. We don't deserve to be his children, but Jesus Christ makes us his brothers and sisters by what he has done for us. And for that, we really should look at one another, look around in amazement. Can you believe we're here? We deserve something totally different, but here we are eating at the king's table. That is the, the greatness of our Lord God.